The other thing I wanted point, uh, to ask was when I was setting up this panel, uh, Jack Vogel wrote an article about uh, the indie bubble, about Reva that, and that caused a lot of debate with uh, creators such as Valambeer and many other indie developers like, debating on the issue. Uh, really, the question I want to ask is, is there an indie bubble, like this relative success of having all these avenue streams, potential revenue streams for different developers, like, is there something like that? Is, is there a potential for a crash, or is this like a misguided opinion of sorts? I don't think there's an indie bubble. Um, I think if you buy into the myth that like being going indie is this get rich quick scheme, then you probably will think there's a bubble. And um, you know, it's not right. Um, it's you know, it's like anything. And I think you know, I think unfortunately when we talk about you know, it's great that we, we talk about indie and, and we, um, we do uphold it as this great thing, because it is, but with that also comes this sort of unfortunate creating expectations of it being this sort of, like, yeah, you can make a game, and as long as you work really hard on it, it's going to do really well, and you're going to make millions, and etc. And that's not how things work. Like, things are messy, and things have a lot of factors in them, you know, which go into them, which you don't think about, like, you know, some of it's part luck, it's part this, it's part that, and, um, and that's always been true, and will always continue to be true, um, so yeah, that's my short answer. Um, I personally don't think that there is an overarching indie bubble that's going to burst, however, I do think there are smaller subsets of indie bubbles that are moving towards bursting. Like, we, like you, you brought up about Steam, and about more games on Steam, and more indie games competing at a time on Steam. I think that there's definitely an indie game on Steam bubble, and I think that that is moving towards bursting, I don't know whether it will or not, but, like, in, in much the same way that, like, Sophia was saying about, if your game is on the App Store, unless you get it featured, nobody sees it. And that like there is just too much stuff going there. Maybe at one point you could put your game on there and it would be viable, but as time's gone on, it's become more and more difficult to turn a profit on your game or that platform. I think that that's I think something similar to that's probably going to happen with Steam or could well happen with Steam. Um, I think that this whole idea of like the big mega, mega success story is like. These people that look at, like, I'm going to make my first indie game and I'm going to turn out, I'm going to be the next launch. I think that that myth is going to hopefully go away, and that's hopefully going to, like, that bubble's hopefully going to burst because the more people start talking up about the fact that, like, not making lots of games before I made Minecraft, it was far from his first game, it was far from an overnight success. And I think the more developers start talking about like how their games are perceived as overnight successes or not, like the, that perceptual bubble of making your your first game and suddenly being a millionaire of the I think that perceptual bubble is going to burst. I don't think there's an overarching overarching bubble of it that's going to burst just because it's so easy now to make a game with no no prior experience to jump in, tell your own personal story, create this passion project with very little funds unless you want to get outside stuff in. I think that that will be immune to any kind of indie bubble crash because no matter what happens to the industry, those tools are going to remain there and anyone can still keep making their games and putting their games out. So I think I think that very accessible entry level is what's going to keep there from being any kind of overarching indie bubble indie crash. We might see growth dips, but I don't think we'll ever a complete crash. Sorry, no, no. I was going to say like to, you know it's really about making niche games, right? And that's that's what's always going to be relevant. Like, if you're making, if you're trying to make a game which, like, absolutely everyone will love, well, first thing you just decide anyway, because no one loves everything. Um, but as long as long as you're making interesting games, which will, which will naturally kind of go into this niche, then you're going to. There's always going to be an audience, right? Um, I mean, I guess you know I can say that because like I made a very niche game. Like, um, there's not that many comedy social network and sci-fi comedy games. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's um, yeah. So it's really about sort of knowing 
um, yeah, knowing you're making something which is like, yeah, your own creative vision and is, is interesting. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know where to start with this one. I think um, I'm, a, I'm a hopelessly naive optimist, so I am more inclined to believe. I did a panel with, uh, well, just a, just a session of developers with uh, Barry Mead, who made the room. Uh, and he says loads of developers just get caught up with this, like, just chasing whatever's hot right now, or like whatever game mechanic is really good, or, like, you know, Candy Crush or whatever. And, Trying to bribe Apple or do whatever it takes to get on from the Apple Store. That, that doesn't exist, but you can kind of uh, point that out. But um, so you know, you said with the room, and that was a massive success. You know, just make it, just make a good game, and everything else will fall into place. I'm sure it's not that simple. Uh, but I kind of, you know, he says it with such conviction that I kind of believe him. And um, and I, uh, I think there is a sort of scientific me method to it. I mean, it's very, very difficult to make a very, very good game. And if you look at someone like Mike Bithell, who um, He's, he's kind of, there is kind of a formula there. Make a great game, you know, get someone like Danny Wallace to voice it. I think you probably, you know, you asked nicely, you probably get that done. Uh, get, get on social media, be honest, be upfront with people. And then, you know, release, release your game, build, build the buzz through social media, and then, um, you know, I, I suppose I might bit all uh, a BAFTA event, and he, you know, like he just got on the Humble Bundle. And, he, and I said to him, yeah, it must be a good day, it's done pretty well. And he, and he said, yeah, I've, I've made X amount of money. I won't say what X amount of money is, but, but it's more than I'll make in about five years, in a day. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of that's crazy. But I think Mike's, Mike's done it really, really well. I think, yeah, this indie bubble thing might might exist a little bit, but I think they'll continue. I think the, the next notch is out there, and the, there will be a, a, a massive staggering success like Minecraft again. But, um, um, yeah, the indie space is, is is really exciting, and I think Mike Biffle is probably an example. And you, you play it pretty well, wouldn't you? Not to, play, not to say play the game, but, you know, there is a formula to... More than just making a good game, kind of getting it out there and being honest with people. So social media is the key. Um, it's interesting you mentioned Mike actually, because um, actually it's kind of relevant today because I'm also um, one of these. Yeah, well, basically another thing I said yes to is writing a book together with um, a, um, a business lecturer at the University of Portsmouth. So um, about indie startups and really kind of what that means from like a sort of. Yeah, what well, well, this whole sort of cultural position of like, you know, India is the next one that means. Um, and we decided to sort of um, basically just form the book out of, you know, interviews, um, like, you know, wrong interviews with various indie developers. Um, and Mike was actually the first interview I did today. Um, and so we chatted for ages, you know, and the reason I got involved in the project, um, so I got approached by, by the lecturer, um, is really because I am interested in sort of unpacking that myth that will be an instant overnight success. Um, and he said more that like the overnight success story takes like about five years sometimes, right? Um, and you know, and, and Mike and I sort of chatted about yeah about his you know because I think from his perspective, from what I understand from the interview, his um, success with Thomas came from. People on YouTube noticing the game, obviously, you know, let's players noticing the game after it had already been out for a while. Because up to that point, he'd only had like a limited number, a limited amount of success in sales, and he was you know, okay with it. But it was it was just as soon as someone on YouTube happened to notice it, um, and obviously, you know, you have to make a good game for someone to want to play it on YouTube. So that goes without saying. It's just making a good game isn't the end of it; it's the start of it. Um, and and yeah, so it's, you know, it's the fact that it is this really complicated process full of lots of things. Um, I mean, from my perspective, I mean, I think my red shirt, um, you know, so far, I've been happy with how it's doing. And, you know, and the reason, you know, I guess, you know, you sort of look at um, how things got to where they are, and it's because I was lucky enough that, that um, I happened to sort of hear about Positech wanting to publish indie games at the time I did, when I had this game that I wanted to pitch, um, and that I was in a position where I was living with my folks and I didn't have any, like, um, you know, any outgoing costs and that, and that kind of thing. So I could, um, you know, I could, I was in a position where I could work on that stuff. And it's really about, you know, all those tiny factors which, which build up to things being successful. Basically. I just want to say a quick one line on something Guy had said about thinking that the next notch is out there. I think the next notch, or the next success story like that is out there, but I don't think that that success story is going to happen until that developer who is going to make that successful game is not aiming to be the next notch. I think that while people are aiming to be that next success, I don't think it's ever going to happen. I think it's going to be someone who makes a tiny little passion project that 
that someone hasn't done before that they really like, and it's going to be someone that doesn't expect it at all. That it's going to happen to much like Notch. He was never like he was never trying to make a game as enormously huge as Minecraft has become. It's just he made the game he wanted to make, and it happened to resonate with people in that kind of way. So I think that I don't think that that success is going to happen again until there's someone that does, isn't expecting it and isn't aiming to try and hit where he's hit. Um, so I don't think that's true. Yes, yeah, Sophia. <laughs> It's, it's quite interesting. I, I don't think there really is an indie bubble that really wants to do anything. But uh, like Laura said, like it's becoming so much easier to make games now. And you don't even know how to code to make games. Like, so it's really, games like Hotline Miami were made in the game maker. So you've got to see But um, I think it's really important to for developers to speak out about how you know it isn't always a success and you know successful games might be it might have been their last chance and that kind of thing. When I first met um like this um before like Thomas would be the same thing released it but um, I hadn't heard of it and he was still working at um Boston Studios and it was only um when I think Total Biscuit came up on YouTube that um, it got really popular and now this whole YouTube thing is coming about with all the organizations and he's really trying to like hide the that so that's, that's a really good thing but I think it's quite interesting and he got that success from the Let's Play and I think that Maybe developers to think about how they can come up with innovative ways to market their game to make it successful. Um, I'm hoping that the game I release with the DNA will be successful because I've kind of got that brand behind me. But obviously, that's not going to work for everyone else. So it's all about just making it work for yourself, living with your parents, whatever, whatever that works for you. Can I, can, I get, can I get a Coke as well? I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting, um, actually, Laura's comment about sort of um, don't, uh, you know, don't aim to be the next launch. I mean, I would encourage people to be ambitious and, like, fair enough, do aim to be the next launch if you want to. I'm sure there's a little bit of everyone who kind of secretly wants to be the next launch. But also understand that it's complicated and you're probably not going to next March and it's just it's really interesting um, because I you know prior to working on Redshirt I actually um, found myself working on a on a tech thing uh, in Silicon Valley which is a whole interesting other world it's like if you think you know the the sort of whole get rich quick mentality of indie games that is that to an extreme like the Silicon Valley tech bubble is just it's insane it's an insane world um, and I found myself in that world um, before working on Redshirt and it is that sort of, you know, and you hear sto you'd hear stories about people like, you know, raising millions of dollars of VC investment by just like writing a pitch on a napkin and passing it to them. It's just, it was crazy. Um, and, um, and yeah, and so, you know, and it's that sort of whole thing of people who are successful will think that the way that they've done it is right. And so we'll talk about it as like the, it's that sort of weird cognitive bias thing of thinking the way you've done things is the right way. And, yeah, sorry, I didn't know this random question. Sorry, no, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to go off on a bit of a tangent. Yeah. But, um, this whole point of um, more indie developers talking about their failures and that whole topic. Byron Atkinson Jones, who's currently, he's just released a game called um, Blasting. He's been releasing sales numbers the whole way through um, since it released. And his sales have not done terribly well. They've done pretty badly, less than he'd expected. And like, he's been very open about doing post mortems and being like, hey, this is what I did up to launch. Here's like, where sales did happen, here's where sales are not happening. And he's just been very open about the fact that, yes, I'm one of those people that poured their work into making a game and it just wasn't as successful as I hoped it would be. And like, I don't really know people like that, people that when their game isn't successful, are just sort of like, look, my game was not successful financially, or by whatever metric it wasn't paid by other people. However, like, I'll, I'll talk about the fact that like, how much work I did and what led up to that happening. And I think that's the side that we don't hear nearly enough about, and I think it's like, you like, need to hear more about to avoid, uh, to avoid the bubble bursting if there is one that's going to burst. Yeah.